Acts. Okay, and this morning we're picking up in the book of Acts, which is talking about the Acts of the Apostles, and we're coming down to the gospel in Antioch. And of course, this is not the Antioch that Paul came out of. Paul and Barnabas are on their first uh, missionary journey at this point. They were sent from Antioch, and they were traveling uh, through the areas, uh, remember uh, John was with them, and of course, eventually John abandoned them, is ultimately what he did, and he went back to Jerusalem. So they went out from Antioch, and then this would be Antioch and Pisidia, is where they ended up. And we, um, up on the screen here, we kind of have a, a general uh, map of the direction that he went on his first missionary journey with Barnabas with him at this point. So now they're up in Antioch right now, and Paul is teaching in the synagogues. Um, oh, yes, uh, there's, our, there's our Antioch where he's at right now, and then there's where he came from. Antioch to Antioch. So, yep, mm -hmm. from Antioch to Antioch. So, of course, uh, it does, and Scripture does actually clarify it's Antioch in Pisidia, which is a little bit different than the one he came out from. So Acts chapter 13 and verse 14 says, but when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and they sat down. So he sat down, they listened to it, and then, which is customary, the, the leader of the synagogue comes up and he says, uh, do you have anything to share? Um, we see that in Acts chapter 13, and verse 14. Uh, and after the reading of the Law and the Prophets, the ruler of, rulers of the synagogue sent to him, saying, Men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Because like I said, this was very customary. He wasn't, uh, so basically he's coming from out of town, and they know he's uh, somebody who's not normally there, so they're going to call to him and say, you know, if you have something to say. Of course, Paul has something to say. He has a lot to say here, you know, and he's going he's gonna to talk about, uh, well, ultimately the gospel here is what he's going to give them. Then Paul stood up and motioned with his hand and said, Men of Israel and you who fear God. And as we were looking at that, of course, uh, in last week, you know, it's involved both the Israelites at this point, and there's some Gentiles that are involved here, some proselytes that are also in the area. You know, so Paul is actually talking to them at this point. And he's going to then, I said, this is an interesting passage here because um, Paul begins to share the gospel and going all the way back to the beginning of when God actually ultimately chose the fathers. So in Acts chapter 13, verse 17, he says, The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt, and with an uplifted arm he brought them out. So, like I was saying, this is the way that Paul shares the gospel with those who haven't heard it yet before. Um, he's starting, now he is starting with Israel, so Israel would understand some of what he's talking about here. Galatians, or Genesis actually, Genesis chapter 15 and verse 12 talks about uh, Abraham being chosen and given a covenant. Uh, here it says, uh, now the sun was, this is in Genesis 15, 12. Now when the sun was gone down, uh, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and God actually tells him at this point that his descendants will be strangers in a land that is not there, and they will serve them, and they will be afflicted 400 years. So Israel, like I said, they're aware of this, and they had just read the Law and the Prophets also. So they, they're aware of what's, uh, what Paul is actually referring to, but he's going to go back and he's going to build his case from there. In verse uh, 18 of Genesis chapter 15, on the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, and this had to do with the land covenant and the promise that ultimately he would bring um, he would bring the people out of Egypt. Uh, Exodus chapter 12 and verse 40, now the sojourning of the children of Israel who lived in Egypt was 430 years, and it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, on that very same day, it came to pass that all the armies of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. So not only did he give Abram a promise, he gave him a promise that was dated, and on that exact day, he, he brought them out. Now again, Israel is aware of this, so he's kind of drawing their attention to this and saying, you know, going all the way back from the very beginning here. 
verse 13, or excuse me, chapter 13 and verse 18 in Acts, he then talks, of course, about uh, he brought them out of Egypt. Now, for a time, about 40 years, he went up with them. He, he put up with their ways in the wilderness. Um, so God brings them out of Egypt to, the, to Mount Sinai. And he's going he's gonna to take them into the land, the promised land right then and there. But, of course, they come back and they're like, no, nah, there's giants over there and we're going to get squished and all this other stuff. Of course, there was a couple of them. They're like, people, come on. You know, God just, like, wiped out Egypt. Let's go ahead and wipe these people out. But the majority won. And so they got to wander around the wilderness for 40 years until their bodies dropped because God wasn't going to allow them to enter into the land and have peace. We see this over in Numbers 32, 13. So the Lord's anger was aroused against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness 40 years until all the generations that have done evil in the sight of the Lord were gone. So at that point, all of those who had basically rejected going into the land for whatever reason um, and had done things that were inappropriate or <laughs> here more specifically, it called them evil. He let their bodies or their corpse drop in the wilderness, and he, then he ultimately brings Israel into the land. In verse 19, and when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their, he, he distributed their land to them by allotment. So he's going to, uh, basically this word allotment, inheritance, so however you want to put that, uh, that's kind of what it's actually referencing, is each of the tribes of Israel are going to have a section of, of land that was, of course, uh, promised <clears throat> the, the land as a whole, which would be Canaan. Joshua chapter 5 and verse 12 talks about this. Then the manna ceased on the day after they had eaten the produce of the land, and the children of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate the food of the land of Canaan that year. So this is when they actually entered in. God destroyed seven nations. Um, unfortunately, Israel did not do everything that God said, and they're still paying for that today. Um, but, you know, of course, manna would be, um, what is it, literally? I mean, that is actually what the word manna means. I, w I, was asking, I was asking somebody the other day about that, and I said, you know, it means what is it? And she said, I don't know what it means. And I said, no, it actually means what is it? Uh, they did not know what it was, but they were being fed by the Lord for that 40 years. They were being fed, and now, of course, when they went into the land of Canaan, they no longer needed the food. Now they're actually getting the promise. So God is actually providing for them. And that's what he's talking about here in verse 19. So God, he, he brings them into the land. They destroy the nations that are there. Um, and ultimately, God brought judgment upon those nations for what they were doing and pushed them out of the land. And then God um, divided up the land accordingly. Then Acts chapter 13 and verse 20 goes on, and after that he gave them judges for about 450 years until Samuel the prophet. So, of course, you know, we had issues with Israel going back and forth. Israel would um, obey God, and remember God gave them a promise, you know, health, wealth, and happiness. You obey me, you'll be healthy, you'll be wealthy, and, and you'll be happy in the land. Your enemies are not going to cause you problems, your children aren't going to be born deformed, you know, God actually gave them protection. And for a time, they would do that. They would obey God, and then they would stray. And they would stray, and they would get caught up with the Philistines and other nations around there. They would start worshiping their gods, and God would bring judgment upon them. And they would be put into slavery. And then, of course, you have this, uh, well, you have this terrible cycle in, in the books here of Judges where they're going through this because they would cry out to God. God would raise out, up a judge. He'd free them. They go through the cycle again. You know, they just, you know, it's interesting how human nature does that. Seven times. You know, yeah. <laughs> Seven times they go through this process, you know, and yeah, you would think they would learn, but no, as a nation, they did not. So in 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 20, and all Israel from Dan to Bathsheba knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. So when it's coming up to the point of, uh, Samuel being as a, as a prophet, that's where the judge is actually in. Judges chapter 2 and verse 16 talks about, Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the hands of those who plundered them. 
So again, you know, each cycle, the Lord would raise up a, a judge, the judge would free them, and then they would go back to the Lord for a while, and then they would go back and do the same thing they had done before. So Paul is kind of reminding them of this, you know. Yeah, um, it didn't take a very long to, yeah, to, to go through these cycles. Um, it's like from generation to generation, they just forgot about uh, the lessons from the past. Um, does that sound familiar or what? So, you know, yeah, I mean, you get, um, it's amazing how we just don't want to listen to what the lessons of the past. I mean, God very clearly showed them. You obey me, you're happy. You know, I protect you. If you don't, you get to pay for, you know, the end result of what you're doing. You know, and, um, but God, God was faithful in all of this. Now he brings up uh, Samuel the prophet. And uh, <clears throat> this, I would assume, would be verse, yeah, okay. So, and then 21, it says, after they, uh, after they asked for a king, so God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. So this is over in 1 Samuel chapter 11, verse 15. It says, all the people went to Gil Gilgal, and there they made Samuel king before the Lord in Gilgal. And they made sacrifices of peace offerings before the Lord. And there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. You know, because of course, at this point, Israel didn't have a ultimate ruler. They didn't have a king. God was actually the ruler. It was through the, primarily through the, the priests at this point. And they wanted to be like other nations. And they wanted a king. So God said, fine. So he... Um, he allows King to be placed, or Saul to be placed as king. Now, of course, God told them, "He's going to tax you, and He's going to take things away from you." They're like, "Oh, we want a king. You know, we want to be like the other nations." You know, and, um, it's amazing how that goes until you actually get the tax bill. Then you don't like it. But you know, um, so regardless, though, they make uh, Saul king, and God actually permits it at this point. Um, and then in verse twenty-two, and when he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. And this uh, will here would be the one doing my desirous will. So having the same heart focuses on the center of a person. David very much um, sought after what God wanted, you know, and this was a, a primary focus throughout all his life, actually, it was. So at this point, remember, Saul, um, he disobeyed God a couple of times, and it got to the point to where on, on this particular, I believe where he was removed, he went in to plunder an area that uh, he was to destroy everything, and he decided to keep a few things. And God said, nope, that's not going to work, and removed him as king. Now, it took a while before he was actually physically removed and that was upon his death. But at that point, God actually uh, raised up David. He anointed him. 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went on to uh, Ramah. So at this point, um, that's when David is actually anointed as king of Israel. And, of course, you know, prior to this, David had some experience with Saul and other things. Um, Goliath, he had killed him already. So he wasn't completely foreign to Saul at this point, but <clears throat> uh, he's actually placed as king. David being the man after God's own heart, it was interesting, too, because he absolutely refused to demand his position as king. He honored Saul until Saul's death, you know, and, and um, very much after God's desirous will. Then in verse 23, it goes on, From this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a Savior. This is Jesus. Now, of course, we're drawing into what's going on now. So he's taken them back from the past and what they know, you know, and, and I'm sure they've listened to these stories over and over again, and we have another a Jew who's coming in and he's telling us the stories again and, and it's it's nice to recount them but they're about to get a surprise because you can add a little bit to it 
In 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 16, it says, And your house and your kingdom shall be established into the age before you. Your throne shall be established into the age. Now, that is actually God giving David a promise. And then here in verse uh, in Acts chapter 13 and verse 23, um, Paul is describing or explaining the fact that according to the promise, God raised him up from, uh, raised up a savior for Israel, and this savior is Jesus. John, uh, excuse me. Acts chapter 13, verse 24 says, After John had finished preaching, before his coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. So this is talking about John the Baptist, of course, at this point. In Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Now he was prophesied before as the one who was uh, in the wilderness telling Israel, Make straight the way of the Lord. He's coming. So John comes. He first begins to preach, um, or more specifically, uh, he's bringing, he's uh, before heralding with authority the message of the king is coming, is actually the way it's, um, this word preaching, that's really what it's focusing on. And he's telling Israel to repent, change your mind, the king is coming. You need to be prepared for the coming of the king. Verse 25, and as John was finishing his course, he said, what do you think, or who do you think I am? I am not he, uh, but behold, there comes one after me, the sandals of, whom feet, of whose feet I am not worthy to loose. Now here, of course, he's, he's referencing, um, we also have in John chapter 1 and verse 20, when John the Baptist was asked by the Pharisees, you know, they, they, well, really the Pharisees sent men over there, and they're asking him, who are you? You know, and are you the prophet? Are you the Christ? You know, and he said, you know, he confessed. That is, he agreed publicly. He said outwardly, publicly, I am not the Christ. I'm the voice in the wilderness. He's coming. The one after me, he's the one who is the Christ. You know, he's the one that I'm not worthy to even loose the, the sandals on his feet. So John finishes his course, and Christ, of course, comes. Verse 26, men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to you the word of this salvation has been sent. So talking about, of course, about Christ. For those who delivered, excuse me, for those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, nor even the voice of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled them in the condemning of him. You know, so now he's going to talk about the fact that, and he calls them out very clearly, the rulers that are in, and not only the rulers, but also those who are dwelling in Israel, who even though the, the prophets are spoken every Sabbath day, because they had just gone through that themselves, they went through the law and the prophets, and they were reading them, and it's done every Sabbath day, they didn't understand it, and in doing it, they actually fulfilled the prophecies that were given. We see that in verse 28. And though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should put him to death. You know, and of course, this goes back to um, the situation where the high priest had determined, well, more, it wasn't just the high priest, it was also the high priest and the council, had determined that they were going to put Christ to death because he was speaking out against them. Uh, he was calling them out for exactly what they were. You know, um, he was not shy about the, the adjectives he used to describe how corrupt they were. And he was very accurate with it, and they knew it. And they wanted him put to death because they, did, they didn't want to lose their position that they had of authority. But they couldn't put him to death because uh, the, the law, that is the Mosaic law, didn't allow it. So they hand him over to Pilate and get Pilate to put him to death because he's a Gentile. He's not uh, governed by the Mosaic law. You know, so they're going to try to basically get a Gentile to do their dirty work and think that it's going to clean their hands. And he's talking about that here. In verse 29, he goes on, and now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. So they killed him. They put him to death. And of course, in the Old Testament, it's very clear. Uh, the scripture 
is very clear on what exactly they would be doing to Christ if you understood it. I mean, Isaiah is a good example of this. There's a, there's a few prophecies that talk about the Messiah and how he is ultimately going to be put to death. You know, even in the book of Daniel, when we're talking about um, the prophecies of what we would now know in, are in Revelation in the tribulation period, said the Messiah is going to be cut off for a week at this point. So, or uh, at the end, excuse me, at the end of the seventh day. Um, there'll be one more. In, verse, uh, in Acts chapter 13, verse 30, he goes on, but God raised him from the dead. So they killed him, but God raised him from the dead. So focusing from the Jews, he comes from the perspective at this point that they are, you know, the one that God promised, the one that he said was going to, he was going to bring a Savior. It was going to bring a Savior that was going to take away their sins. He brought him. And exactly like the prophet said, the people in Jerusalem put him to death, more specifically the Jews. And yet God raised him from the dead, so he gets to the resurrection at this point. In verse 31, he goes on, uh, He was seen for many days by those who came up from him, uh, came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are witnesses to the people. So, you know, after his resurrection, he didn't go around and secretly only meet with a couple of people. It was actually over 500 people who saw Christ resurrected. That's a lot of witnesses, especially when the law says if you got two witnesses, you're good. He had 500 witnesses, you know, and even in the book of Luke, when Luke is, is describing this, he's like, you can go ask them now. <laughs> They're still alive when he was writing this book. You know, so, and of course, Paul here is, is not specifically one of the witnesses, but he's saying um, he knew what had happened. He not only knew that they had put Christ to death, he also now knows very clearly that he was resurrected and that he is God in the flesh. Verse 32 goes on, we declare good tidings to you. And we declare to you good tidings that promises which was, <clears throat> that promise which was made to the fathers. So he's going to declare that to them, that Jesus was raised from the dead. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And of course, in the second Psalm, it's specifically referencing Jesus. Um, in verse uh, 34, he goes on, and that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken thus, I will give you the sure mercies of David. So he actually raised up, uh, at this point, talking about raising up Christ to no longer die. He's not going to ever face corruption again. He's not going to face death at, at any point. And then in verse uh, 35, it says, Therefore he also said in another psalm, You will not allow your holy one to see corruption. <coughs> So he, he's pulling in the Psalms here, and of course this Psalm is from David in verse 36. For David, after he had served his generation, by the will of God fell asleep and was buried with his fathers and saw corruption. So he wasn't talking about David, you know, in the Psalms it wasn't referring to David, it was referring to, to David's offspring. He's the one who wouldn't see corruption, and he wouldn't see corruption because God was going to raise him from the dead. Uh, Christ's body did not see corruption. Acts chapter 13 and verse 37, but he whom God raised up saw no corruption. You know, I was actually working on a, another, uh, I'm working on another short video on the uh, time of resurrection or the death and resurrection of Christ and showing that, you know, Christ died on a Wednesday and what was going on and then he was resurrected on, on Sunday at this point and looking at all of this, uh, and in this passage here, we see that God did not, his body didn't see corruption, you know, and uh, in, in talking with this point with other people, they'll come and they'll say, well, as soon as the body dies, it begins to, to corrupt, you know, but the reality in scripture and what it's talking about is the body getting to the point where it begins to stink from corruption. And Lazarus is an example of that, you know, where, um, God left him in the grave for four days, and he did it on purpose. 
you know, and he did it to show that he could actually raise the dead. And not just the dead that are, you know, maybe he was dead, maybe he wasn't. You know, he's four days in, and when, when Christ asked to roll the stone away, what was his sister's response? But Lord, he stinks. You, you don't want to do that. You know? um, and that, of course, is telling us in that region, a body could not be in the grave for more than three days. And that, that is three full days, by the way. So on the fourth day, he had to be raised. Otherwise, his body would begin to corrupt. Um, and you would get that stench from corruption. So God actually kept his word. His body was resurrected. And that's what Paul is talking about here. He was raised from the dead, um, just as God said he would be. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. Uh, this word preached here is announced. It's announced to you the sending away of sins. Paul does use a different word here that oftentimes we in English don't pick it up. And the reason being is, especially because as the message comes to the Gentile, the focus is on the um, sending away of sins. But Israel would have understand the distinction because there's another word that means cover. Now he, or an, an English, the English equivalent to that is atone. Christ did not make an atonement for our sins. He actually sent them away. Now, under the Old Testament, <clears throat> under the Old Testament, atonement was made for sin, which just meant they were covered up. Now, Paul is telling them, through this man is actually not the covering up of sin, but actually the sending away of sin. You know, and then that should have perked up their ears. They should have been, well, you know, there's something different going on here. In verse 39, he goes on, and by him... Everyone who believes is justified from all the things which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So he's bringing up the fact that, you know, obviously the, through the law of Moses, a man cannot be righteous before God. That was not the intent of the law. The intent of the law was to show us that through our own self-effort, we, we can't produce good works. It's not possible. Now, the Mosaic law absolutely was a righteous law, and it still is, for that matter. We don't, as Christians, we don't live by it because we live by grace, and if we're living by grace and, and actually living by the commandment we have, which is to love one another, we're not going to violate anything that relates to the Mosaic law anyway. So there's no reason to put a do not on you if you just simply do. The do nots will, will inherently be there because they're opposite of what you're doing. Um, but under the law, they couldn't be justified, and they knew it, you know, and Paul is actually bringing this up, you know. He's the one who can bring justification. Verse 40, beware, therefore, lest what has been spoken in the prophets comes upon you. Now, you know, a little bit of, uh, um, he's drawing again attention to Israel and going back to the past and saying, you know, the truth is coming to you. Pay attention. Don't, don't do what the prophets uh, have prophesied of. Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish, for I work a work in your days, and a work which you will by no means believe, though, <clears throat> though one were to declare it to you. So he's saying, I'm, I, and of course this is the prophet, God is working something among them that they're not going to believe, even though it's been directly declared to them they're still not going to believe it. And this word declare kind of had the idea of manifested. They saw it. They understood it, what was going on there. Right, it's that type of a word. Uh, so he's warning them. Um, yeah, let's move on to the next time. Now, I seem to have... Let me check real quick on this one, because, uh, so he talks about the, ah, yes, okay, so at this point, I uh, probably should have put a pause here, because <laughs> I lost my place. Um, this is where his conversation kind of stops. He's saying at this point, you know, um, don't, don't fall, don't do what the prophets said the people who wouldn't believe will do. You're going to perish. And that's, he stops it at that point. Now, 
from here, the Gentiles that are among them, they want more information. And they're going to ask Paul, you know, come and speak with us uh, on the next Sabbath. The Gentiles, of course, these would be more specifically proselytes at this point, but they are the Gentiles. And they're very interested in this, and we see this in verse uh, 42. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them on the next Sabbath day. Um, and these words are actually these individual utterances that, that he might come in and he might uh, uh, tell them these individual utterances on the next Sabbath day. They want to hear more information about this. Um, and as a result of this message, many of them were actually saved. Of course, these would be devout Jews. Uh, the devout Jews would be a reference to those who are uh, saved under law. Um, that is, they believe that God is in the temple. Um, they're not saved by law. <coughs> they're saved under law. And the, uh, the other side of it would be the proselytes at this point. And they're Gentiles who have been converted to Judaism. And, of course, we know that they're proselytes because they're in the synagogue. That's where all of this took place place, and they're asking them to come back to the synagogue and teach some more on the next Sabbath. So in verse 43, and when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. So as I was saying, these are, uh, these are both devout Jews and proselytes. Um, in Acts chapter 13 and verse 43 is where we see that. Now, sadly, they do exactly what Paul just told them don't do. He's telling them, you know, don't, don't reject the message, but yet the Jews at this point are going to reject the message. And, and sadly, they're going to do it for the most ridiculous reason when we see it. You know, as we move on, we'll see here, Acts chapter 13 and verse 44, it says, and on, this, on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. So, you know, word spread, and it spread quickly, and no doubt this went beyond just the Jews and the proselytes, because it talks about the whole city at this point. And this is primarily a Gentile city that we're in. You know, this isn't a, a Jewish city. So basically, you know, the way they described it is the whole city came together. Granted, it probably wasn't the entire city, but it was a substantial amount of the city as this word spreads of the forgiveness of sins. Verse 45 says, But when the Jews saw the multitude, they were filled with envy. And contradicting and blaspheming, they opposed the things that Paul said. You know, they're actually, um, these are ones who were filled with jealousy. Uh, this word, uh, this jealousy, this filling here, has the idea of one who is controlled by this. So they were, they were filled in a way to where it began to mentally influence what they were doing. Um, that's your filling term here. Um, jealousy was just that strong. So as a result of that, out of this jealousy, they begin to speak against Paul and what he was saying. Now, it's kind of interesting here because it's not out from saying that they didn't believe. They're doing this because they're jealous that he brought all the people together. You know, they're like, man, all the things we tried, we couldn't get hardly anybody to listen. And now this man, he, he shows up one Sabbath. He's got half the city. Well, actually, the whole city is the way it describes it, following him, and they're very jealous over that. So, so they begin to speak against him, and then they also begin to blasphemy him. And remember here, your term blasphemy has the idea of they are falsely attributing things to him, which is kind of interesting. you got to wonder what kind of things they were talking about, Paul. It doesn't go into descriptions, but it's very clear that they're beginning to speak and blasphemy Paul and Barnabas at this point, because they're both Jews. Verse, verse 46 goes on and says, Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. Um, let us correct this... Uh, this one here, which says uh, eternal life. 
or excuse me, everlasting life, um, that is actually your word eternal life. And that's your normal, um, that's not an everlasting. Uh, there, there's, there is a difference. Okay? All human beings have everlasting life. All, if, once you are born, you will never cease to exist. The question is, what state are you going to be in for the rest of eternity? Are you going to have eternal life, which is God's quality of life, or are you going to be permanently separated from God? So what he's talking about here is saying, you all have considered yourself to not be worthy of eternal life. That is basically staying with God for the rest of their lives. So he's like, fine, you want to do that. So for the Lord has commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. Now, again, he's speaking to Israel at this point. Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 6 says this. It is, to, it is to light a thing that you should... Let me try that again. Is it... That's kind of a funny way of... Um, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the um, scripture here. Uh, first, uh, Isaiah chapter 49 and verse six, 6, he says, He says... It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the uh, pres preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. And in, in in what he's talking about here. Uh, Israel actually was set as a light to the nations. They were supposed to take God's word to the nations. Um, and that's what Paul is talking about. But he's saying, since you guys didn't want to do it, then actually what he does next is he shakes off his clothes and he says, fine, I'm going to the Gentiles. You know, he's, he's not going to listen to them anymore at this point. So from here we have uh, Paul, of course, this is the first missionary journey. Uh, we're not done with the journey yet because he hasn't gone all the way back, but um, he's now up in Antioch of Pisidia. He's brought them the gospel. There's been a huge response, you know, primarily Gentiles, though. The Jews, due to jealousy, they're, they're basically rejecting his word, and they're lying about things because he comes in, he shares the gospel to them. Um, he shares it, of course, starting with the Jews. He goes to their synagogues, and it's the Gentiles that are in there that actually begin to spread it around to the entire world. Now, there's not, uh, he's not saying no Jews accepted him, because we do actually have some of the devout Jews, those were the saved ones. They were transitioned over from the promises related to Israel into the promises related to the church at that point. Unfortunately, the Jews as a, a, as a majority, shall we say, the majority of the Jews reject him. Um, this is where they begin to, to speak really bad things about him and, and do other stuff like that. And, and then uh, we have the Gentiles who are accepting the gospel. So it's interesting to see how Paul brings the gospel to the Jews, how he, he takes them back to remember what God did. Takes them all the way back to their fathers where God chose them. He brought them through Egypt brings them out into the wilderness again, reminding them of what God was doing there, into the land of Canaan, um, through the judges, through Samuel, um, and then through Saul and, and, King, and King David at this point. Um, he's reminding them of all of them, and he's logically bringing this forward to show them that based upon what was prophesied and what was told to King David, Jesus is the Messiah, the one that was promised. And he came. Our, our leaders killed him, but God raised him. Now, I'm here to actually tell you that he, this one, through him, is justification. It's not through the Mosaic Law. It's through him. You know, and he gives them basic, well, he does give them the gospel. You know, granted, it's not as clean as we see over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he's talking to Gentiles. You know, the, and there is a difference because Israel should have known. They had the, the law. They, they, they were the ones that God was paying attention to. God wasn't doing anything else with the Gentiles. Israel was the nation. They, they had that knowledge, but they had rejected it. You know? So he does tell them very clearly. They put him to death. God raised him. Now, he's, now this man is the one who is being preached 
for justification which will result in the forgiveness of sins.